Howdy students, we are going to move on to chapter 21 of The Young Man and the Sea. When the whoosh comes by. When you hear a foghorn, you're supposed to signal back. That way the other boat gets an idea where you are and steers away. Trouble is, I never thought to bring along a horn. Didn't even think there might be fog, which is really dumb because I know better. Maybe that's what the dream is telling me about, not having a voice. Don't matter now, there's nothing I can do but listen. Blah. Big old foghorn seems to be getting closer. I can hear a boat engine thumping. Then it seems to be going away, and the engine gets fainter and fainter, and the horn sounds smaller, than the, and then the wake comes through and rocks me like a baby in a cradle, and I'm alone again inside the fog. How long did you sleep, you reckon? That's me talking out loud to myself. Got no good answer, because another thing I forgot to bring along is a wit wristwatch. Figured I'd know what time of day it was from the sun, but the fog has come on thick again, and I can't tell where the sun is, except it feels like I slept for a long time, so it might be afternoon now. Skiff Beeman, you are a darn fool. There. Almost feels good to say it. To speak the truth out loud, only a darn fool would do what I did. Go to sea in a ten-foot plywood skiff without a thought in my head but catch a big fish. Like there was no room in my brain for what happens if there's fog, or you can't find the fish, or you can't hit the fish even if you do find them. Turns out I found the fish all right, but it don't matter because I'm not big enough or strong enough to hit one with the harpoon. So here I am, 30 miles out to sea, in a blind fog with nothing but a few peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a jug of water. Oh, and a compass, in case I decide to give up and go home. Which I ain't ready for, not yet. Why bother? Home is dad on the TV couch and a boat with no engine and a rich kid laughing while he cuts my traps. Home is where my mom don't live anymore, except she's still there somehow, in all the rooms of our little house. Me and my dad missing her something fierce and not wanting to give up how much it hurts because that world would be like, that would be like forgetting. Home is a rickety old dock and an outhouse with a half moon cut in the door and the bright orange flowers my mom called outhouse lilies. Home is where everything happens, good or bad, except it's mostly been bad lately. So I'm lying there in the bottom of my little skiff, munching on a sticky sandwich and feeling sorry for myself when the whoosh comes by. Whoosh! There it is again. Sound of something slicing through the water. Not far away, either. Right on the other side of the plywood hull, a few feet from my head. Whoosh! Careful, I tell myself. Sit up slow. Don't rock the boat. Don't scare away whatever it is that's making that sound. I sit up real slow and see the top of a fin over the top edge of the boat. Fin like the curved edge of a knife. A fin as blue as the sky on a perfect day in May. Big blue fin making the whoosh as a giant fish circles my boat. Harpoon is lying along the seats with the tip out over the bow. I now know what I want to do, but can I do it? Gotta try. Now or never. No mistakes allowed. I take the harpoon in my right hand while I'm still sitting down, facing the back of the boat. Keep hold of it while I, e uh, ever so quiet, stand up and turn around and face the front. Front, Quiet now, quiet as a mouse. I stand on the seat without making a sound and look over the side into the dark, wet eye of a giant blue fin tuna, close enough to touch, and so alive I swear I can hear his heart beating. I'm looking down on the biggest fish i ever seen in my life. Bigger than me, bigger than my boat. Bigger than any tuna I ever seen brought into the dock. I got the harpoon raised, but I don't dare move. Not until it's perfect. Not until I'm ready to strike. I swear the giant fish is looking at the boat. Like, maybe it wants to know if this is where the chum comes from that, uh, from that brings the mackerel it likes to eat. Can it still pick up on the scent of the bait I was cutting up and tossing over? Is that it? What's it thinking? Why is it circling my boat? Or is it circling me? Curious about a small boy with a long stick in his hand. I never realized how much bigger a bluefin tuna looks when it's alive in the ocean instead of dead on the dock. I can feel the power as it swims by, making the boat rock with the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh of its giant tail, shoving it through the water as easy as can be. Man on the dock said the tail can move faster than the eye can see, but this one is going slow, gliding along as easy as can be. Almost like it's showing off. Look at me, you puny human. Look at my big bad self. You never seen nothing so awesome as me. The big blue fin is so amazing and so beautiful, I almost forget what I need to do. Almost, but not quite. My dad used to call it getting froze up. 
Man out in the pulpit of a tuna boat, he's waiting for hours for a chance to throw, and when the chance finally comes, he can't do it. Like the fish sort of hypnotizes you into not throwing the harpoon. Froze up. Come to think of it, that's sort of what happened to Dad when Mom died. Except he ain't on a tuna boat, he's on the TV couch. Stuck on how miserable he feels. Never mind your father in the couch, Skiffy. Concentrate on the fish. She's right. There's plenty of time to worry about my dad later. So I wrap both hands around the shaft of the harpoon and plunge it straight down at the biggest part of the fish. Straight down with all my might. Straight down so hard and fast I fall halfway out of the boat and my face is an inch from the water and I'm looking down and I don't see nothing. The fish disappeared. Gone in the blink of an eye. Had my chance and missed. Again. I groan and roll over and rub my knee where I bumped it, and then I fetch the harpoon and pull it into the boat. That's when I notice the barb is missing. Must have come loose when I fell down. Great. Harpoon. Without a barb, it's just a long stick. Then I remember the barb is attached to the keg line, so all I gotta do is pull the line in and put the barb back on the harpoon. Who knows, if I drift around for another hundred years or so, I might find another fish as big as the one that got away. Anyhow, I put my hand on the line and give it a tug, and then a weird thing happens. The line slips through my hands. Line is running out of the tub, over the side of the boat, and straight down into the water. For a moment, I can't make my brain figure out what that means. Line running out of the boat. And then I stand up and shout, Fish on! Fish on! at the top of my lungs. Nobody around to hear me, so it's like I'm shouting to myself to make me believe what happened. I hit the big fish! He's got the barb in his back, and he's diving deep, dragging line out of the tub. I'm so excited, I fall down again and crack another shin, but I don't even care that it hurts because I got a fish on the line. My dad used to talk about the first dive a bluefin makes after it gets hit. They call it sounding. Most often, a fish will go right to the bottom and stay there for a while until it figures out what happened. Sometimes a fish will run straight across the surface, skipping and leaping and trying to shake the barb loose. Other times a fish will give up and die right away if the bob got buried deep enough. My fish hasn't quit, not yet. Line's whipping out like he's running clear across the ocean. Already the tub is more than halfway empty and the line is still running. I'm staring at it, trying to figure the best time to throw the keg over the side, wanting to check the knot that holds the line to the keg. But I don't dare. There isn't time. Whatever knot I tied will either hold it or it won't. When there's about a hundred feet of line left in the tub, I go to pick up the keg, and that's when a loop of line snags in the tub. Without thinking about it, I reach my hand out to clear the snag. Big mistake. Snag whips around my wrist fast as the blink of an eye. There's no time to get loose of it. There's no time even to take a deep breath or get ready for what happens next. Because the moment the snag closes around my wrist, the line jerks me over the side, and the next thing I know I'm flying out of the boat and into the water. Into the cold water and down pulled down by the fish that hooked me, by the fish that's trying to kill me. Well, sounds like uh, Skiff has some good news and then some very bad news. So he looks like he's finally got a hold of the fish, but he made a mistake and now he's attached to the line and he gets sent overboard. So I'd be curious to know, what are your predictions? How is he going to escape this or is this going to be the end of Skiff? I look forward to hearing your comments below and I'll catch you next time.